So you can move to uh, next slide. So when talking about that, that's fine. When talking about um, standing um, for grandparents and third party, we have to look at what happened before 2018 and after 2018. So um, basically, next slide. I, maybe I should run the slide. <laughs> okay. Um, before 2018, uh, since 2011, uh, Pennsylvania has provided for three specific categories of people who would file for any form of child custody, and that was a parent, a grandparent or great-grandparent, obviously under certain conditions, and a person standing in local parentis to the child. That was before 2018. After 2018, um, PA Act 21 was passed that made some changes to the custody law and added a fourth category of uh, people who could file for any form of child custody. And basically any individual, as long as the child was not part of a dependency proceeding, uh, and if any of the following criteria uh, were proven to the court. So basically the individual had assumed or was willing to assume responsibility for the child, that individual had a sustained substantial and sincere interest in the welfare of the child. And then neither parent had any form of care and control over the child. Um, <clears throat> now that act, which was act 21, um, provides for some factors that the court may consider when determining uh, the interest of the third party in the child, and that, um, and that included the nature, quality, extent, and length of the involvement by the individual in the child's life. An interesting fact about this Act 21 is that um, while it doesn't mention grandparents, um, its legislative history points to grandparents as being the intended beneficiaries of the Act. Um, so one of the co-sponsor, um, a senator, Senator White, um, in his memorandum introducing the, this legislation, explained that the amendment would help relatives that are increasingly assuming the role of primary caregivers due to the opiate and heroin epidemic in the Commonwealth. And he wanted to assist the relatives um, when parents were absent by providing a legal route for those relatives to pursue custody. Now, um, why the need for the change? So statistics show that from 1999 to 2017, almost 280,000 people died from overdoses related to prescription opiates. So it wasn't actually legal drugs, it was the prescription opiates um, that did the damage. And Governor Wolf issued a proclamation of disaster emergency in early 2018, uh, citing the uh, drug uh, overdose, the rate of drug overdose in PA, which was 36.5 per 100,000 um, people, which was double the national average. So as we remember prior to 2018, um, if a parent was not available, um, the only people that could file for custody were a grandparent or a person who was standing in local parentis. That's, that's it. So basically Act 21 came as the legislature response to the opiate crisis and its impact on Pennsylvania families. And what the act did, it expanded the grandparent custody and third party custody categories and added to those able to request custody of a child through the court. Now, <clears throat> when we're talking about the grandparents and the third party standing, we're looking in terms of uh, legal framework to the sections 5324 and 5325 of Title 23, and that deals with standing. So we don't have a definition of the standing, but basically a determination of whether a specific uh, person is the proper party to bring uh, a case in the court. And that determination of standing needs to be made before proceeding uh, with a custody action. And the reasoning behind this is because it tries to protect the interest um, in keeping a family unit free from um, strangers, from third party, 
uh, no matter how well meaning that uh, that person is. So um, this slide um, basically um, provides the um, section 5324 language, which is standing for any form of physical custody or legal custody and enumerates the individuals that might file for Again, any form of physical custody, which can, could mean sole custody, uh, primary custody, partial, supervised. And those individuals are a parent of the child, a person who stands in local parentis, and then a grandparent who is not in local parentis if certain um, uh, conditions are being met. You can move on, uh, Tim because we're gonna discuss about them later on. And um, at paragraph four and five, this was added after Act 21 was uh, passed. And basically it has to do with the individual who's willing to assume responsibility of the child um, and the other factors, uh, if neither parent has any form of care and control of the child, and if the child is not the subject of a dependency. So we can move on. Now, the second um, section uh, of the statute, 5325, provides spending for partial physical custody and supervised physical custody. And this grants grandparents and great grandparents um, the right to bring a, a partial custody action uh, when the parent of the child is deceased um, or when the relationship of the child begins with the consent of the parent or under the court order and uh, parents have commenced a proceeding for custody and there is no agreement as to whether the grandparents or great grandparents should have custody under this section. Or a third um, uh, circumstance under which a grandparent or great grandparent could file for partial custody is when the child has been residing for at least 12 consecutive months with a, grand, with a grandparent or great-grandparent um, and is removed from the home by the parent if the action is being filed within six, month, six months from the date of the removal. And uh, we're gonna talk about this later on. So, so if you remember, section 5324 provides uh, for individuals that could file for uh, custody. Um, and the first uh, one was uh, a parent of the child, and the second was a person who uh, is in local parentis. Now, uh, we don't have a definition of the local parentis. Um, the statute does not provide um, such a definition. Uh, it could be a grandparent or a third party or a great grandparent. Uh, it, so basically, any non parent could be in local parentis. In order to determine, you have to look at the case law. It is very fact specific. So uh, for the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna try to provide you with case law and things like that to um, help you in determining whether someone uh, stands in local parentis or not. The um, main, I would say, case law that bring some insight into what we have to look when determining if a client has in local parentis is the TB versus um, LRM uh, case coming out of the Supreme Court in 2001, uh, where Supreme Court um, has come up with um, some factors that we have to look and they are assumption of a parental status by the third party the discharge of parental duties by the natural parents, and um, what I will call consent of the natural parents, although the language in the, um, in the court decision says um, for the third party not to be in defiance of the parents' wishes and the parent-child relationship. So it doesn't actually say consent, but just not to be in defiance. So again, this slide provides the three factors in local parentis, which is assumption of parental duties by the third party, discharge of parental duties by the natural parents and consent of the natural parent. And I'm gonna discuss later on what it means and how consent can be, if it has to be expressed or implied. Um, <clears throat> talking about the first two factors, assumption and discharge of parental duties, usually a party must 
generally show that he or she lived with a child, a natural parent in a family unit, and, the, and that party cared for the child as a natural parent. Um, <clears throat> next one. Now, some case law. So I wanted to provide you with some case law. Obviously, there are some of them. There are more than, uh, than just three cases, but you can expand on uh, by shepherdizing <laughs> um, anytime you need um, help or you have a case where uh, in local parenthesis is the issue. So the first one is the Supreme Court, the 2001 TB versus um, RM, um, where the court um, determined that um, was the mother's uh, girlfriend lived together in, in an exclusive relationship and they share day by day child um, responsibilities. So um, they lived together for three years and the court determined that um, the former life partner acted in local parentis because they lived at a family unit and assumed the role um, of the co-parent by carrying uh, out day-to-day -day care of the child. And again, um, they left together for, for three years. So the court, the Supreme Court concluded that just uh, by um, the three year um, of basically providing child rearing and having the consent of the child natural mother, that was sufficient to confer the in loco parentis uh, status or standing. Uh, the two cases are coming out of the superior court. One, the first one is a 1996 case. Um, in this case, again, we have the mother's former life partner that acted in local parentis uh, because uh, she lived with a child and the natural parent in a, a family setting and participated in caring for the child as uh, any primary uh, breadwinner uh, in many traditional families would do. And also in this case, I think parties have... Um, executed some documents indicating their intent to raise the child together. So that was another thing, another factor that the court has considered in uh, uh, making this determination. In Bob versus Bob, I think that's the way you pronounce it. That's a superior court decision from 1998. Um, the... Um, <clears throat> Case is a little bit uh, complicated, it, not necessarily that complicated, but um, there's a husband and wife, they were married, then they divorced, and then they reunited without remarrying. So during the party separation, the wife became pregnant by another man, then the parties reunited and they care for the new baby, and the natural father had no play in the child's life. And then the party separated again when the child was one year old and the husband sued for partial custody of that child, um, alleging uh, in local parental status. And um, basically the superior court um, determined that the uh, husband um, had um, local parentis because he lived with the mother and the child for a one year and performed the duties of a parent and had the consent of the mother to perform the duties of a father, although he was not the natural father. Okay, next one. Next slide. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> one thing that uh, we tend to look when we, when we analyze, I'm sorry, um, in local parentis is the amount of time spent by the third party with the child. And I guess the question is, is that this positive? And we have the answer, uh, by the Superior Court in a case issued in 2000, which is McDonald versus Son, um, where the court says that the child, the time spent with the child is not dispositive. However, it is indicative of the significant relationship. So in that case, we have um, the child spending 50% uh, of uh, per year for a four year period of time with the uncle and aunt, um, but the court also considered other factors in, in, in that case. Um, and the, in that case, the fa natural father had limited contact with the child and actually challenged paternity in the beginning. 
um, the child's mother suffered from mental illness and she actually died from injuries that she inflicted on herself. And because of the mental illness, her mental illness, uh, the child stayed a lot of time with her uncle and uh, aunt. Um, and they perform uh, parenting duties such as enrolling the child in school and taking the child to the doctor when necessary. And also before the natural mother died, she signed a part of attorney granting in local parentis powers to the aunt for the child. So uh, taking all those factors into consideration in superior courts, they um, decided that, determined that the uh, aunt and uncle had standing to support custody of the child. However, so while the amount of time spent with the child is not dispositive, um, what a party must show is that or he or she intended to be bound by the responsibilities of parenthood without the need of formally adopting the child. So the next case that I wanted to uh, bring up to your attention is a Superior Court case from 1997, where again, grandmother actually spent one year with the child, by, but the court determined that grandmother did not have a local parental stat, status or standing. So why is that? Um, <clears throat> the, the fact of the case is that the grandmother filed for custody after her daughter, her 16 year old daughter died in a car accident and the father gave physical custody of the child to his brother and sister-in-law. So the 16 year old daughter and the granddaughter lived with her for the first year of granddaughter's life. Um, the court looked at what uh, she was doing during that first year and court concluded that while um, she was taking care of the grandchild, she wasn't taking care as the, uh, of the grandchild from a uh, parent's standpoint of view, but more as a babysitter or a caretaker. And the court also uh, characterized um, the, grandma, the daughter's act of leaving her child with the grandmother as appropriate, given the fact that we were talking about a young unwed mother who was trying to better herself and to uh, obtain education and develop socially. So um, they concluded that um, the grandmother did not intend to be bound by the legal duties and obligation of a parent, but then again, more as a caretaker or a babysitter for that child. Now, if you remember we were discussing in the beginning that there are three factors that we should consider when determine standing, and that one was the assumption of the uh, parental duties, the uh, discharge of parental duties, and the third one was uh, so-called consent. Um, so this again, this factor is a very specific, fact specific. Uh, it differs from case to case and even the case law is all over the place. So um, uh, case law actually difference, differentiates between objecting to the starting of a relationship between the third party and the child at the beginning or later on. So I um wanted to bring up to you five cases um, where the court is all over the place. In some cases, it would grant um, standing because consent was that. In other cases, no. So the first one is a Supreme Court case from 1999 um, where the Supreme Court uh, reverses grant of in local parentis uh, standing or status because the natural father has consistently opposed the adoption of the child and actively sought custody of the child uh, shortly after the child was born until the case was litigated. Um, the second case, again, is a case where it's coming out of the Superior Court from 2007, Morgan case, where Superior Court um, basically determined that the child's legal guardians never permitted um, the third party to assume parental status or discharge parental duties and to the contrary, um, even the third party acknowledge uh, that the legal guardians actually opposed him exercising any sort of, of rights towards the child. And the opposition has been hostile and very aggressive. Now, um, the third case that I wanted to bring it up is that 
is because that's where it, that's one of the cases where the core differentiates between the objection. What are the objection of the natural parent takes place at the beginning of the relationship between the third party and the child or in the middle of the relationship somewhere along the, the line. So in this case, uh, which is a, a superior court from 2003, um, uh, I'm not sure if it's Libner or Leibner, um, but the superior court um, emphasizes that the defiance of the natural parents must have been at the beginning of the parent-child bond with a third party rather than um, into when the relationship was already uh, created. And in that case, if I'm not mistaken, um, we have basically the natural parents were okay um, it was one of the natural parents, which was the mother, was okay with the third party having a relationship with the child for six years um, since the child was almost born. And then because that natural mother remarried, suddenly she didn't want the uh, the third party, which was her ex-paramour, to, um, to have any contact with the child. And uh, when that uh, third party file for partial custody of the of the child um, the court determined that that third party had standing because for six years that party has developed a relationship with the child and now the natural mother cannot come after six years and basically raise the issue of non-consent the <clears throat> Another case that um, I wanted to bring up was uh, another Superior Court case from 2000, which was McDonald versus Son. Uh, is the same case that we, we discussed before um, that discusses the issue of consent of the natural parent. Um, and in that case, <coughs> um, the court um, refused to apply the defiance principle uh, when natural father uh, didn't um, raise um, the lack of standing uh, of the third party petitioners. Um, and the reason for that is because the natural uh, father initially denied paternity, had little contact with the child, had no contact with the third party <clears throat> that was filing the petition for custody. So there so therefore, having no contact with the third party, there was no way that the third party actually, um, was trying to stand in local parentis in defiance of his relationship with the child. And the last case, um, it's a, again, it's a uh, superior case from 2017. It's the, uh, this is a uh, more recent case. And in this case, we have the grandmother actually, who filed um, uh, for custody under in local parentis status under 50, 324 uh, two and um, uh, again and there's always no in there was no direct consent for the grandmother to get involved um, in the child's life but the grandmother mother and the child lived for five years as an intact family and the grandmother was um, uh, exercising parenting responsibilities um, and the court, indicates that the father implied consent um, to the development of the in loco parentis relationship between the grandmother and the child by failing to oppose the grandmother's assumption of parental duties and by allowing her to share in the parental responsibilities with the mother. Next slide, please. All right, so, <clears throat> As you can see uh, from the prior slide, um, cases are all over the, uh, the place. So, uh, and, and that's good because you have a lot of cases available. So um, you can use whatever case fits your, um, your client. <laughs> um, so you have cases that might help your client, you may have cases that may not help your client, but they are out there for you to pick and choose. Now, one issue that uh, came up in one of my cases, I wanna bring it up, um, is whether or not foster parents have in local parentis. And the answer, the short answer is no, they lack standing to seek custody of a child. And you have the two cases there available uh, in case this issue comes and you need to brief the court. Uh, one case is from 1984, they're both um, superior court cases. Um, the first one is the in, 
in rare adoption of crystal DR. So the court determined that um, foster parents lacked in local parental standing to seek termination of parental rights uh, because when a child is in foster care, responsibility for that child is divided between the child's parents, the child welfare agency, and the foster parents and that the foster parents care for the child is subject to agency supervision and the relevant statutes make clear that the placement is intended to be temporary with the goal of reuniting the family. And in a 1986 uh, superior case, preserves, um, the same court um, addressed the issue if former foster parents had standing to pursue an action for custody, so initially in that case, the foster parents were approved and given physical custody of the minor child. Then uh, pursuant to a subsequent court order, the child was placed in another foster home in which the child's brother resided. The former foster parents filed a complaint seeking custody and the complaint was dismissed uh, by the trial court for lack of standing and the superior court affirmed citing actually Crystal, uh, the first case, and emphasizing that it is in the nature of the foster parent-child relationship which warrants the conclusion that foster parents lack standing to seek custody. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so when talking about a grandparent's standing for any form of custody, um, so we discussed that they have standing under 5324 as in local parentis, if they stand in local parentis. If they don't stand in local parentis, 5324.3 provides for standing for any form of physical custody or legal custody if the relationship with a child began with the consent of a parent or under a court order, if the grandparent is willing to assume responsibility for the child and one of the following conditions is met. Child has to be found dependent on the juvenile law where child is at risk due to parental abuse, neglect, or incapacity, where the child has for at least 12 consecutive months resided with the grandparent and has been removed from the home by the parent. And in that case, an action must be filed within six months after the removal of the child from the home. So, <clears throat> next. I wanted to bring up some cases also as well um, regarding grandparent, grandparent standing. Um, now, the, um, this case has to do with a grandparent, grandparent standing uh, when there's a dependency proceeding, right? Because that was one of the conditions that was supposed to be met. The child had to be found dependent under juvenile law. Um, so the first case, um, is in Re CLP, which is a 2015 P Superior Court. And um, in that case, uh, <clears throat> the grandparents tried to file for, um, for custody, for physical and legal custody. Um, the child has been adjudicated as dependent. Uh, the trial court said that because there hasn't been a uh, there could still be a permanency goal of reunification. Um, the grandparents shouldn't be allowed to file uh, for custody. The trial court decision were, was reversed um, and superior court said that grandparents have standing to file for any form of physical or legal custody uh, when their grandchild has been adjudicated dependent, not dependent, notwithstanding a permanency goal of reunification because the statute only requires that the child be found dependent now that the parents' rights be terminated or the dependency goal be changed to adoption. And that is indeed the case because if you go back and you look, it just says one of the following conditions is met, child has to be found dependent under juvenile law. That's it. That, that's all that is being required under 53-24-3. Um, Next one. Um, now, this is a, another uh, case that has to do with dependency filing under, uh, under this factor. And um, it's another superior court, a recent one from 2018, MW versus ST. And in that case, um, I, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, the children, when the grandmother filed for custody, um, the children were dependent, were in the dependency proceeding. 
by the time the case ended up in the trial court, the children were no longer uh, dependent. So um, the children were placed with, uh, with their natural parents. In that case, the Superior Court said because the children uh, were placed or no longer dependent and were, were placed with the natural parents, uh, the trial court was correct in dismissing the grandmother's complaint for custody uh, of her grandchildren for lack of standing. And then you have all the reasoning there. So Now, as you remember, um, in order to file for, as a grandparent, in order to file for standing for any form of physical custody, um, one of the following condition has to be the child has to be found dependent or child has to be at risk due to parental abuse, neglect, or incapacity. So this next case uh, is dealing with that factor, actually risk of harm to of parental abuse, neglect, or incapacity. So in this, this is an interesting case. It's coming out uh, within the same year of the last one uh, from the same court, Superior Court in 2018. Um, and this case, um, basically we have a, uh, we have two parents that um, were um, heavy abuse, heavy uh, drug abusers. Uh, we have a we have the maternal great grandparents who were awarded uh, primary custody of the child, and then we have the paternal grandparents filing a petition to intervene and requesting partial um, physical custody of the child. The Maternal great grandparents who already had custody filed objection, preliminary objection to the standing. The court. Um, granted their preliminary objections and decided, uh, I'm, talking, I'm talking about the trial court, and decided that the uh, paternal grandparents do not have uh, standing because the child was in the primary custody of maternal great grandparents and there was no risk of harm of, uh, from the natural parents. So, Interesting enough, the Superior Court actually reversed the, the decision, the trial court decision, and came up with this ongoing risk of harm, um, which basically is created since the parental rights have not been terminated or relinquished. So the court says it is possible for either parent to seek custody of the child. So because, uh, because both parents are heavy drug users, then that puts the child uh, at an ongoing risk of parental neglect. And therefore, the paternal grandparents could bring a partial claim for custody under 53-24-3. I, I thought it was a very interesting decision, but <clears throat> nevertheless, it's something that we can use. Now, um, so we discussed 5324 section. Now the, uh, we're moving to the next section, which is 5325, which provides standing for partial physical custody and supervised physical custody. So as discussed before, under this section, a grandparent or great grandparent has standing and may bring an action for partial custody if the parent of the child is deceased um, in which case that uh, uh, grandparent or great grandparent of the uh, that of the uh, deceased parent could file for partial custody um, if the relationship with a child began with the consent of a parent or under court order, and where the parents of the child are in a custody proceedings and do not agree uh, that the grandparents should have custody. And the third factor is if the child has been residing for at least 12 consecutive months with a grandparent and has been removed from the home by the parent. And again, the action like under 5324, the action must be filed within six months after the removal of the child from the home. Um, 
I don't see a problem with the uh, the section. I think that it's pretty straightforward when it comes to the first uh, fact that the parent of the child is deceased, um, where the child has been residing for 12, or the third one, where the child has been residing for 12 consecutive months with a grandparent or great grandparent and has been removed. Um, the only, uh, the cases where I'm seeing uh, some issues are, that are filed under number two, which is the relationship has to begin um, with the consent of a parent, there has to be a uh, custody proceeding between the parents, and there um, and there is no agreement regarding whether or not the grandparents or the great grandparents should file for custody. So that, those are kind of like the, the the cases where I see them coming in and where there's an issue and there is actually um, arguments that needs to be filed sometimes and and um, hearing needs to be, take place. Okay, next one. So, um, <clears throat> how to file for custody now that we know the law? Um, how to file for custody as a grandparent, great grandparent, or third party? Um, you should file a custody complaint or a petition with the Court of Common Pleas. Um, now, you need to file a complaint for custody if no custody order has been issued. But if there is a custody order in place, you need to file a petition to change the existing order by filing a petition to intervene. Um, which form, again, you, you need to choose depends on whether or not there is a previous custody order in effect. Um, very important, make sure that you plead uh, standing factors in your filing. What happens next after you file? A, uh, for as on behalf of the third party or the grandparents. <clears throat> the other party may raise standing by preliminary objections or at a custody hearing or trial, or the court may raise standing sua sponte. Now, this is the rule that governs um, the um, uh, jurisdictional venue and standing issue. That's rule 1915.5. And in the third party plaintiff custody action, which standing has not been resolved by preliminary objection, uh, the court shall address the third party plaintiff standing and include its standing decision in a written opinion or order. What I want you to, uh, the question of ju jurisdiction venue, that's up to Diane to discuss. But what I want uh, people to look at is the rule 1915.5, when it talks about preliminary objections, it says that a party may rise. It doesn't say shall rise, which is different than actually when you're talking about question of jurisdiction of venue. So a uh, say party may rise standing by preliminary objection or at a custody hearing or trial. So basically standing issue could be raised at any time. And in the brief that I submitted, um, as attachments, you're going to see that one of the issues that I discussed in that brief uh, was the issue whether or not my client has waived um, objecting to standing because she didn't file a um, uh, she didn't file a preliminary objection. And you're going to have there my uh, legal argument that no, and based some of it was based on Rule 1915.5. Some was based on on case law, but um, that brief actually has a, a section uh, that discusses um, this issue. So if ever comes up, you can use it. <clears throat> okay, next. So if the other party is filing preliminary objections, right, uh, raising the issue of standing that your client doesn't have standing, you might have to file a responsive brief. Um, case will more like, most likely be scheduled for a hearing on the issue of standing alone in front of the judge. Make sure that you prepare your clients because again, it is very fact specific. So make sure that your client is uh, well prepared to testify at the time of the hearing. Uh, make sure that you interview possible witnesses. Um, be mindful of case law that's not in your favor because you're gonna find that and be ready to uh, differentiate the facts in your case from the case law that's being presented as unfavorable. So what happens after standing is granted? Well, <laughs> winning a hearing on standing is the first step in your client's goal. Um, 
the grandparent or the third party must still present evidence and their testimony and convince the tribunal that will awarding the grandparent third party custody is in the child's best interest. As we know, there are 16 factors that the statute provides for in determining what's in the child's best interest, and that's in section 5328. Um, also, a non-parent has to overcome the presumption of custody in favor of a parent. And you have the section of the statute right there that discusses this, which is 5327. And that presumption in favor of the parent may be rebutted by clear and convincing evidence as the statute states. Next one thing. So some practical tips, um, gather as much information as possible from your client. Remember, it is very fact specific. So the more factors in your client's favor, the higher chance of success. Some questions to ask your client. What's client's relationship with child? Was client living with a child a natural parent? And if so, for how long? What kind of responsibilities client assumed for the child? Were the, parent allow, were the parents allowing client, client to exercise some parental duties? Was anyone objecting to client's involvement in the child's life? And if so, when did it happen? Again, we're going back to when uh, implied or expressed consent was, or, was given. And we're, we're going back to the case law that says basically that if you're coming three or four years into the relationship already developed and you object to the relationship, it's too late. Uh, were parents using client as a babysitter or was client allowed to make decisions such as medical, educational, et cetera? Next one. Um, that's the last slide. And that's the conclusion, I guess, to remember a grandparent could file for primary custody under a couple of sections. Um, so basically you have 5324-2, which talks about in local parentis, three, Right, which talks about exp expressly about the grandparent who's not uh, standing in local parentis, and four, which was added by Act 21, um, uh, which talks about any individual who can file if uh, neither of the parents has uh, the care uh, of the child, and um, that individual is willing to assume um, the responsibilities for the child. So there are different sections under which you can actually fit your client's case. Now, regarding partial and supervised uh, custody, a grandparent or a great grandparent could file under 5325, right? This is the section that provides for that. And finally, a third party, which can be relatives or not, could file for any form of custody under 5324-2. Again, that has to do with local parentis, or four that has to do, again, with a, that was added, has to do with an individual who can file. Um, if he's willing to assume the responsibilities um, of the child and has connection to the child and the parents uh, and the child is out of control uh, of uh, the natural parents. So that's all I have.